Well, it's finally time to talk about the inscriptions in Tales of Majael, and I think this is a fun topic because the majority of the inscriptions are viable, and it really depends on what kind of role you want them to play for your character, which stats you prioritize on gear, or how aggressive you play. I think this all comes into consideration when you decide what kind of inscriptions to use, and it's very possible I'm missing certain strategies with some of these inscriptions, so I'm looking forward to seeing what people think about this. Before we get to talking about the specific ones, first of all, the big difference between infusions and runes is the infusion saturation. This is a debuff that increases the cooldown of your inscriptions the more of them you use together. So if you are running 5 infusions, you can definitely feel this having an effect and runes have nothing like that. So this incentivizes you to mix them together to get around this downside. I will not be talking about any of the injectors from the Tinker expansion, just because I've not really played with it much in the regular campaign. I know from playing the Embers of Rage campaign that they are extremely powerful, but since on the majority of characters you can't really use them anyways, I decided to skip them. And the tiers will mean this. In S, I will put inscriptions that I think you should run pretty much on every single character ever. These just are way better than anything else you can use. In A, I will put the great ones that you will use on the majority of your characters. In B, I will put the good ones, which can still be really powerful, but they begin to be a little more niche. C will be the bottom of what I think is usable, and this will be the most niche inscriptions. And then in D, I'm going to put inscriptions that I think don't really have a place in the game, and I personally would never use. So let's get into it. Starting with the Primal Infusion. It is instant speed, and it gives you all damage affinity, as well as a debuff cleanse in the form of reducing the duration of a random debuff each turn. This is only really ever usable if you are a willpower character, otherwise it's just really weak. Damage affinity is a fairly rare stat that makes you heal from damage taken, and this will happen before resistances get applied to the damage, so in theory, with high enough damage affinity and high enough resistances, you could actually heal from damage. So it's definitely a powerful stat, and I had a lot of fun playing with it on my Demonologist, where you have a talent that uh, gives you all damage affinity. Unfortunately, what really holds Primal Infusion back is its cooldown. 18 turns is very long, and the debuff removal, since it's random, and it doesn't actually remove the debuff just due to the duration, it's not very reliable. You are basically only taking this for the damage affinity. Uh, this scales with healing modifier, so if you have some type of character that has an insanely high healing modifier, this can be an interesting option, but on the majority of characters there really is not much of a reason to use this over the regular inscriptions. The healing infusion. I am excited to talk about this one, because I think this might be one of the more controversial ones. From what I've seen, not that many people like using this, but in my opinion this is the best out of the inscriptions that just give you life, that give you survivability. Nothing beats the healing infusion. It has a very short cooldown, 10 turns is right about in that sweet spot where you might actually get multiple uses out of it in combat, and the reason why it's so good is that it not only gives you life, but it also removes debuffs. This circles back all the way to my opinion about Cauterize, which is a popular prodigy, that basically just stops you from getting one shot. If that is your goal, obviously you will choose something like the Shielding Rune or Storm Shield that give you more actual life than the Healing Infusion, but I find myself dying to debuffs the majority of the time, so being able to squeeze some debuff removal together with getting a bunch of life is just invaluable. This is really good against rogues that can apply really dangerous poisons, and this doesn't just cleanse one of the effects, if you are wounded and poisoned and you have a disease, it cleanses one of each. And while it might seem really niche to only be able to remove 
this limited range of debuffs, it actually happens very frequently. So for the cooldown and for the ability to cleanse debuffs, the healing infusion is going into A tier. I try to run this on the vast majority of my characters. So now let's just wait and see where some of these other inscriptions end up. But before that, we have to talk about the heroism infusion. This is cauterized in infusion form. It gives you a big buffer of negative health, making sure that you never get one shot. And then the big advantage is that if it times out while you are in negative life, it will set your HP to one so that you can use all of that negative life again. So those are the advantages. Let's talk about the disadvantages. First of all, it has a massive cooldown of 25 to 35 turns. So you are very unlikely to use this more than once in a fight. But by far the biggest problem is that you are getting this temporary HP at the end when all of your real HP is gone. Whereas all the other inscriptions that help you survive give you this temporary HP at the beginning. This is really important because it gives you information. It lets you react and adapt to the situation depending on how much damage you are taking. And if you are taking too much, it lets you realize uh, maybe I shouldn't be fighting this, let's run away instead. With the heroism infusion, it really tries to push you to just stand there and fight and take advantage of this massive increase in HP and ideally you will be on a class and with gear that gives you negative HP so that you can take advantage of that. So maybe something like a necromancer, but uh, it just feels so terrifying to me to use this because if I'm dropping below like 50% HP, I am looking for a way out. I'm looking for a way to reset the combat because it is not safe. You can see how that clashes with the heroism infusion where below 50% HP, it's not even giving you any benefit at all. You literally need to be on the verge of death for this to start helping you. And then you better make sure that you never make a mistake. You never misjudge the situation because while this will give you a lot of life, if something burned through all of your real HP, are you really 100% confident that it's not going to burn through the heroism infusion as well? I am definitely not, so I'm going to put this into D tier. I don't think there's ever a scenario where I would want to use this. The movement infusion, my beloved. I wish there was a stat in the game that would show you how many times the movement infusion has saved your life. This thing is just absolutely ridiculous. It is instant speed. It can get below 10 turns of cooldown. It is infinitely versatile as you can use it to simply maybe dodge a projectile or close the gap to an enemy. But ideally you will always save this to run away. And unless you get surrounded, as long as you have your movement infusion, you should be able to disengage just about from any fight ever, which as you can imagine is really, really good. The early game movement infusions are like 400, 500% increased movement speed. So while those are very useful, especially by the late game, once you have movement infusions that reach close or even over a thousand percent increased movement speed, this is just no contest to the absolute best inscription in the game. It is survivability because if you run away, you cannot get killed. It is debuff removal, because you can run away while stunned, you can run away while confused, although sometimes you will run to the side, but for the most part, if you try hard enough, you can run away while confused, you know, silenced. The only thing that stops this is getting pinned. And the good news about the other downside, getting surrounded, is that you can play around this. There are not that many classes that can summon stuff behind you, mostly Annihilator, Necromancer, because the skeletons can teleport. Something like Oozmancer, if you are hitting it in melee range, uh, it can summon oozes behind you. And certain enemies have gap closers that can make them appear behind you. So really the best way to play around it is to just be super scared of one by one corridors. Outside of those, it's really hard to get surrounded. Many, many times this will also be useful if as you are running away, you will get pulled back in there's all kinds of talents that instead of the enemy gap closing to you, it pulls you to them. But this will not cancel the movement infusion. 
so you can continue to immediately create the distance again. This is what I spent my first 40-50 gold on every single run and I think it's a large part of consistently getting through the early game in Tome. One thing worth mentioning is that despite how good this is, I basically never run two movement infusions. The reason for this is simple, uh, despite being able to ignore debuffs, it does not actually cleanse any debuffs, so I tend to use all my other inscription slots for that purpose of cleansing debuffs and actually fighting, so it is very rare for you to need two movement infusions. Next up is the regeneration infusion, and it is the first one that is not instant speed. This is a massive deal, because I think for the majority of players, while you have some options for offensive inscriptions, you'll likely save your inscriptions as lifelines to help you get out of bad situations. And there are two combat situations that you can find yourself in, in Tome. Either you will know about the enemies before they know about you, so this means through the use of track, for example, and this will let you safely pre-buff and possibly even pull the enemies around the corner one by one so that you don't have to fight all of them at once. And in that type of situation, you should ideally never be in danger, since if it looks like it's just a fight that you won't be able to win, you can just not take that fight. The other situation that can happen is if you get surprised. You turn the corner, you get teleported into a room, there are two uniques, a random boss and two other rares just standing around, all staring at you, all ready to kill you, and at that point every single turn is crucial. You can't really afford to press your regeneration infusion, it doesn't really matter if it's going to regenerate 600 life per turn, if during that turn that you spent on casting this, you take 2000 damage. Basically, in situations that are low danger, I would say a generation infusion is A tier, if it's like medium danger, it's B tier, and if it's like really really bad, then I would put it into C, because you just might not have the time to cast it. This is not how I want my inscriptions to perform. I need them at their best in the worst situations. So this is another one that despite being quite popular, I don't think it's actually that good, especially because of the decently long cooldown and it only lasting 5 turns. But this is not the whole story for the regeneration infusion, because if you go anti-magic, you will get access to the fungus tree, which lets you, with a decent amount of investment, prolong the duration of regenerations, letting you run a single regeneration infusion permanently. This, I think, instantly catapults this into A tier, because it is much easier to find a turn to press this when, instead of 5 turns, it's going to last 12 turns. When this has no downtime, it just feels infinitely better to play with. So on anti-magic characters or characters with the fungus tree, I think this is A. But without this, and for the majority of characters, I don't think it's too great. The Wild Infusion. So there are quite a few variations of this one. It has a low cooldown, it's instant speed usage, and then, in the early to mid game, it will cleanse one type of debuff, either physical, magical or mental, and give you some all resistance. That's what reducing all damage taken means, even though it might not be very intuitive. Then in the late game, you will start finding wild infusions that will cleanse two types of debuffs. Uh, funnily enough, I don't think those are actually that much better. Now obviously they are better, you can cleanse an extra debuff, it's just pure upside, but you usually use wild infusions for a specific purpose. So in the early game, until you get stun immunity, I personally always run a physical wild, because uh, every other enemy seems to have a stun in the early game, so this is always useful. After you get stun immunity, I often run a mental wild, which lets you target confusions, and on characters that can get silenced, this is the best way to get rid of silences, since it's an infusion, it's a nature power, getting silenced means you can still use this, so that is very helpful. The second, just as good part of this, is that it gives you a bunch of all resistance. For all of the inscriptions, 
you are always looking for as short of a cooldown as possible. It's much more important than the infusion being slightly better, because you just want these up as much as possible. But since these drop a lot, you should be able you should be able to eventually find the one that has a low cooldown, while at the same time giving you that all resistance for the maximum possible for turns. And that can be very impactful. If you have enough debuff removal, this can even double up as just a purely survivability infusion, and you can just use this at the beginning of a fight to get 40% all resistance for 4 turns. That's not a bad deal at all, and it's something that uh, I'll return to once we talk about the blink rune. So yet again, the combination of debuff removal and survivability earns the wild infusion A tier. It is a core part of the majority of my characters. Next is the wild growth infusion. If you're a little confused because you've never seen this, I wouldn't be surprised. This is a reward for one of the alchemists if you complete all of his requests and it instant speed pins all enemies in radius 5 around you, dealing a bit of physical nature damage to them while also giving you a bunch of armor and armor hardiness. It scales with mind power, but even on those characters I can't imagine a scenario where you would ever go for this one. It's pretty hard to get in the first place since you have to target one of the alchemists and the effect seems just so incredibly unimpactful. So this is a firmly D tier infusion, there's a reason why you've never seen this and you likely never will. The Rune of Dissipation. This is the rune you get from killing Urkis if you are not anti-magic. It takes a full turn to use, but it removes up to 8 magical sustains from enemies or magical debuffs from you. So magical debuffs are usually the least important ones to cleanse, the least dangerous. There are a few exceptions to this rule, but for the most part you never put a priority on it. So the main reason you run this is to remove the sustains. Some of the most powerful sustains are magical. So all of the ones that increase speed or give a lot of damage penetration and increase damage. If you've ever played a mage type character in Tome, you will know that there's just a ton of power in the sustains. So this is decently useful against some of the rares and uniques you will run into, but more importantly, a lot of the unique bosses that you will run into are mages. So the Master, the Grand Corruptor, Celia if you decide to do that, and eventually, once you get to the final boss, Elandar and Argoniel both have a ton of very powerful, super scaled up magical sustains that are extremely useful to strip. For these reasons, I always try to squeeze in the Rune of Dissipation on basically all of my characters. It shouldn't be uh, the first, second or third inscription that you take, it should be the fourth or the fifth one. It fulfills an important role in the late game and I think really what brings it over the edge to actually being really good is the ability to remove magical debuffs. Because like two or three times during the run you will actually use this to remove a magical debuff and you will be very happy about it. So in my opinion the rune of dissipation is firmly A tier. Rune Reflection Shield is a unique rune that always scales with magic and it gives you a shield that also reflects all incoming damage. If you don't put a lot of points into magic, you shouldn't ever use this, but if you do, this scales better than the regular shield. It has 15 turns of cooldown, but that's pretty much the same as the regular shield, so it's just strictly better on magic characters. And what really pushes it over the edge is the fact that it also deals damage back. So it's another ideal candidate for the 4th, 5th inscription. I can't decide whether or not I should put this at the bottom of A or at the top of B. I think I'll put it at the top of B. One of the big reasons why I also like it is that it has a cool visual effect, which uh, unfortunately doesn't actually translate to any power. So extremely solid, but more of a filler than something you absolutely need. If it doesn't drop, it can be substituted for something else fairly easily. A Rune of the Rift. So you get this for killing the twin boss, 
to time-based twin boss and it takes a full turn, it's single target and it deals some temporal damage while also sending the target four turns into the future, which basically means it just disappears for four turns. This is a powerful effect. Paradox Mage has a similar talent that lets you kind of poof out an enemy out of existence and it is insanely strong to be able to remove the most threatening target out of any combat, but the difference between it being a talent and being on a short cooldown versus it being on a 14 turn cooldown and taking up an inscription slot is pretty massive. I also assume this can be resisted, so you can't really run it on any character that doesn't have a lot of spell power, so while this can be very powerful situationally, that's not really what I'm looking for in my inscriptions. So while you could argue this can fill a role as your fifth inscription, I would much rather have something like the Rune of Dissipation. Rune Mirror Image. This one um, I've played in the past, then I didn't play it for a long time, and now I'm playing a Skeleton Bulwark, so I'm using all kinds of runes that I've not used a lot, and I've gotten a sort of new appreciation for this. It takes a full turn to use, and then it summons up to three images of you that will immediately taunt all enemies and then repeat that taunt every single turn. The images copy all of your life and resistances, so they can get pretty tanky. And usually what will happen is they will disappear because they only last for six turns, not because they die. This is quite good in the early to mid game. Since the clones taunt immediately, the fact that it takes a full turn to use is less of a penalty because you should not be taking any damage the turn that you use this, and then a few turns after. And the advantage against just doing something like a shield is that it also tanks all kinds of debuffs because the enemies will use their most powerful talents on the clones, stunning them, confusing them, and then you don't have to deal with that. So I found it to perform really well, I'm now in tier 3 dungeons and it's still really useful. Unfortunately it has a really long cooldown of 24 turns and once I get into the late game, uh, just relying on the clones to tank all of the damage, unfortunately once I get into the late game I doubt this is going to hold up since everything does a lot more damage, the clones will not be nearly as tanky and I think it will be more and more felt that this takes a whole turn to set up. Still, I think this deserves a spot in the B tier. It's very solid as sort of a filler role and I think uh, if you use it even in the late game, it will still be pretty decent. It's just at that point uh, you might look to some other inscriptions. Next is the Prismatic Rune. This randomly rolls a different amount of damage instances for different damage types that it's going to block, then it takes a full turn to use, and then you just have to pray that the enemy that you are fighting does those damage types that you have the words to, and I really don't like it. I think they can be decent if it rolls a lot of physical damage ward, then you could argue that you're going to get use out of this in the vast majority of fights, but uh, it's not really better than the other defensive inscriptions like healing or storm shield or even a regular shield, but unlike all those, this takes a full turn to use, and uh, because of the way inscriptions work, uh, since you can't swap them out constantly, for example, you know, if this rolled 8 lightning wards, you could wait until you fight Urkis or some kind of lightning elemental, and then you would put this on, but that's not really the way the game works, so unfortunately I think this is D tier. Moving on, there's the Acid Wave Rune, which is first of the two more offensively tuned inscriptions. This one does acid damage in a big cone and disarms. The key here is that the disarm cannot be saved against, so if the enemy does not have disarm immunity, they will always get disarmed. And that is very useful, considering that this arm is possibly the most debilitating effect that you can apply. Definitely to weapon classes, since they won't be able to basic attack or use any of their talents, 
and while it's definitely much less effective on casters, taking away their weapon still might reduce the damage a little bit at least. But honestly, even if we accept that it's only good against weapon classes, if we talk about uniques and random bosses, the majority of them are going to have at least one weapon class. And the damage this does is also not irrelevant, especially in the early to mid game, this is impactful. So I think this rune is actually pretty good. The problem is, I never use it, but this is where uh, kind of playstyle comes in, and I'm confident that uh, this is actually good. And if you told me you run this every single time, at least in the early game, and it performs really well, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. The second rune of this type is Biting Gale, and this is the same scenario, a big cone, this time it does cold damage and freezes enemies, it encases them in ice. The ice block effect, what it does is that while the target is frozen, 40% of the damage you deal is dealt to the ice block instead of the enemy. And also, you cannot apply any, any form of debuffs to the enemy while they are frozen. So oftentimes this is just really, really annoying when the enemy gets frozen, because then you'll have talents that just apply a debuff and suddenly you feel really bad about using them, since like half of the talent is wasted. So I really don't think this one is very good. So Biting Gale, I think, belongs here with the D tier inscriptions. Perhaps you could argue it's the bottom of C, but I really just don't like freezing enemies. Oh, and they are both instant speed, both of these runes, which is very important. Without that, uh, they would be pretty bad, but because it's instant speed, the extra burst of damage is very relevant. You know what, I changed my mind. I'll put it at the bottom of C. Yeah, I, I think it belongs with these, these three. Especially uh, when I looked at this one, um, Ethereal Rune, I realized that it has to be in C, because this is just extremely useless. So this makes you invisible, which reduces damage you deal by a massive amount, as well as giving you all resistance and movement speed for 5 turns. Um, at least it's instant, but um, I'm not really sure what it's supposed to do. I know invisibility in Tales of Marjorie has been changed a few times, so I assume this is a remnant of the past, where it was filling some kind of role, but as of right now, it's worse than a movement infusion at running away, it's worse at giving you all resistance than the wild or the blink, since it also reduces your damage. Um, as far as I know, there are some very, very minor benefits certain classes have uh, for being invisible, but nothing that would justify running this. So I think this one is the worst one out of the ones we've talked about so far. Maybe it's a little better than this uh, pinning one, uh, but not really something you want to ever run. The Storm Shield rune. Here we go. So this is an instant speed effect that gives you the Bone Shield effect. It lets you completely block a certain amount of damage instances over a damage threshold. But the only downside is that these usually only appear later on in the game. Uh, it is possible to actually find them early. I'm not exactly sure how the generation works, but even though it says that the level range is 30 to 50, I have found it once or twice in a shop way, way before that, but th that is extremely rare. For the most part, um, usually if I want one, I pick one up uh, when I'm going to the east. There are big differences between good and bad Storm Shield runes. And I'm not talking just about the cooldown, which is the way it works for every other inscription, but I'm talking about the threshold, because if it's too low and any white trash mob attacking you will trigger this, that makes this really weak. But if you're in a situation where you are 1v1ing a really powerful enemy, or the threshold is high enough, then it is obviously very powerful. You should think of this as the best inscription purely for blocking damage. It should perform better than the shield, and it should give you more life than the healing. It's also psychologically extremely comfortable to have, because 
As long as you see stacks of storm shield on the right side of your screen, you know that you basically can't die. You can still obviously take small chips of damage, but any big damage will simply be entirely blocked. And despite all this, I don't run storm shield on I would say 90% of my characters, because I would really like storm shield in the first like 10, 20, 30 levels where unexpected bursts of damage can be a big problem and you stack flat HP to deal with that. But later on, I think a healing inscription is simply much better than a storm shield rune because of the ability to cleanse debuffs while giving me some health. Unless the character that I am playing is extremely squishy without a single defensive talent or sustain. So for example, I ran a storm shield rune on a shadow blade and it felt perfect for that character. But for me, it's more of a niche option. So I'm going to put it at the top of B. And this one, I think, will have some disagreement because I think a lot of people pick up two storm shield runes as soon as they can, but that's just not the way that I play the game. It's absolutely the best way to block damage. If that's what you want, take the storm shield rune. Seeing these side by side, you could argue that the Storm Shield rune is better than these, and I agree, which is why it's above them, but at the same time, I think it belongs into the tier that I described at the beginning, in that, to me, it's a great inscription that's more of a niche option rather than one that I default to on most of my characters. Next is the Mana Search rune, and this one is really bizarre to rate, because this is either S tier, if you don't have any mana regeneration, but usually most of these classes have a talent that gives them mana regeneration, and at that point you get rid of this rune. So it fulfills an important role, but very temporarily, and after that I don't think you're ever going to run it. So I'm going to put it into D, just kind of evaluating it by itself, it doesn't really belong on a tier list like this, since it's so different from all the other inscription, but judging it based on the scenario where this is a choice and not a requirement, you really don't want to run this if possible. Instead of spending a turn to start regenerating some of your mana, you can instead just run away entirely, recharge all of your mana and have an actually useful inscription instead of this taking up a slot. The shield rune. This instant speed gives you a shield. This is the highest amount of life that you can get for most of the game, as you will only encounter storm shield on higher levels. It can go down to 14 turns of cooldown, which is noticeably longer than the 10 turns of the healing confusion, or even the 12 turns of the storm shield rune. So I think on the vast majority of characters, this is purely a placeholder at best. You can run it in the early game if I find a really good one. Sometimes I run it alongside the healing infusion, something like wild movement, healing, shielding, uh, but then I will try to replace it as soon as possible for shatter afflictions. Basically, it's never optimal. It's usually just a placeholder until you find something better. The one exception to this rule would be something like Archmage that has sustains that makes all shields more powerful and you should definitely take advantage of that and use the shield rune on those characters, but the rest of them probably not. The Blink rune. So this one is very interesting because it has multiple uses. It takes a whole turn to cast and it teleports you within line of sight. It starts off with a fairly short range, like 3 to 4 tiles, but once your primary stat is fairly high, this can scale to 7, 8, 9 tiles, so it can teleport you very far. The only downside is that it has to be within line of sight. So for example, if you do not have light radius, you cannot teleport that full distance, but usually this is not a problem. Then the other bonus is that this gives you out of phase which is a buff that gives you all resistance, defense, and decreases the duration of newly applied debuffs to you. And it's something that you can find on gear as an item modifier, 
and it caps out at 40%, which is really easy to do with the blink inscription, since a decent one will give you 20% plus all resistance, so even with just a single other piece of gear, it's very possible to get it to 40%. Now unfortunately, this bonus does not add to your out of phase on your other teleports. So if you have let's say a cloak that gives you 20% out of phase, using the blink will get you to 40%, but using any other teleport will still only give you 20%. But what you can do is if you first use the blink and then before the buff times out, you use another teleport, you will keep that 40% out of phase. So it is possible to maintain it. This is very powerful as 40% all resistance should get you very close to the cap of 70% resistances on most characters. The thing is, I don't think that's really why you should use this rune. Because if you want all resistance, you can get it, and you can get it at instant speed with the Wild Infusion, where it can last for 4 turns. Sure, here it could possibly last for 20 turns. If you have enough teleports, you can keep it up indefinitely, possibly. But if you just told me that you purely want all resistance, I would take instant speed, 4 turns of all resistance, versus let's say 10 turns of a full turn taking all resistance. So the way I think of this is just as a nice bonus. Really the best part of this is the teleport, which in the majority of cases is just straight up worse than the movement in the fusion at getting you out of a bad situation. The only scenario in which this is better is if you get surrounded. But as I mentioned, usually you can play around that. And um, it is actually just so much worse at running away from enemies. I think if this was instant speed, it would be S tier, right next to the movement. I think it would still be worse, but just by a tiny bit. As it stands, I believe it's B tier. It's a very competent escape option that is just unfortunately overshadowed by the movement infusion on the vast majority of characters. And it is difficult to justify running both a movement and a blink rune, since you then have to sacrifice either survivability or the ability to cleanse debuffs. Teleport rune. This is kind of a meme rune. I don't really know why this exists. It randomly teleports you in a massive radius. Basically it fulfills the same role as something like wraith form, where if you are going to die and you just have no other options, you can just walk into a wall and randomly teleport on the map and hope that it teleports you to safety and not to another enemy. And that is a great option to have on otherwise good talents or if the price to pay for that is a single class point. But if the price for that is an entire inscription slot, that is just really, really awful. I think this is the worst one out of these because in a lot of situations, this is just actively bad. This is harmful to use until you clear out most of the level. So I'm not really sure why this exists. This next one is the Taint of Purging. And it's another one of those that you might not have ever seen. And it's another one of the Alchemist rewards. This one is focused on physical debuff removal, where it will remove a random physical debuff from you every turn. And each time it does, it increases its duration, so let's say for the sake of argument, it removes a single physical debuff from you for the entire fight. Is that good? No. No it isn't. Especially because it takes a full turn, and because these types of effects that remove a debuff each turn, uh, they are not exactly reliable. So let's say you get stunned, but you also get pinned, and you turn to your taint of purging to help you out, you will have to spend a turn to cast it, then it's going to hit the pin, so you're getting a hit for two turns, you might get other physical debuffs applied to you, and even if you don't, you will cleanse it on the third turn. So it takes you three turns to cleanse it, which uh, is just really bad. So this is a nightmare scenario where you are just standing there for three turns doing nothing. Instead, if you have something like a physical wild, 
plus, let's say, Shatter Afflictions, you can try for the Physical Wild. If you hit the pin, then you still have the Shatter Afflictions to remove the stun. It all happens instantly, in the same turn, and then you can continue fighting or decide to run away if needed. So I don't think you are ever going to run the Taint of Purging. I'll put it right here next to the other Alchemist reward. And last, but definitely not least, Shatter Afflictions rune. This is the golden standard of debuff removal, since it removes one of each type, magical, physical or mental, and its instant speed. The only thing you care about on Shatter Afflictions is the cooldown. The shield you get from this is just a nice bonus on top, but it should never be prioritized. I would even rather have a 12 turn Shatter Afflictions that gives me uh, 10 shield per cleanse debuff, rather than like a 14, 15 turn Shatter Afflictions that gives me a 100 shield per debuff. But yeah, it's obviously really, really good. It's again debuff removal combined with a bit of survivability. The only possible weakness is that if you get silenced, you cannot use it, which is why you run a wild mental on the characters that are vulnerable to silence. But uh, you'll never be unhappy to have a Shatter Afflictions, it's useful in every single fight. I didn't exactly plan for this, but the way this ended up, this is actually my sort of default setup. I always run a movement, I almost always run a Shatter Afflictions, a healing and a dissipation rune, and if I am swapping something out, it can be the wild if I take a prodigy that helps me with debuffs, but most of the time, uh, a nice wild that gives you, let's say, physical and mental cleanse in the late game uh, is my preferred choice, and I find this setup to be very reliable and perfect for the way I play. So this is the way that I see inscriptions in Tome. I hope this was useful and thank you for watching.